So hello everybody. I would like to welcome you to this uh, EPOS webinar on upper limb problems in genetic and metabolic diseases. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank our sponsor of Autopediatrics for pr providing support for this webinar series uh, and also for this webinar today, of course. And uh, I would also like to thank uh, Sani Hiltonen for uh, providing a smooth uh, uh, process of uh, this uh, webinar already in advance. Uh, the moderators of this session are uh, Professor Sackers from Utrecht uh, in the Netherlands and myself, Sebastian Pfarr from Vienna. I personally serve as the EPOS Upper Limb Chair and Professor Sackers uh, of the Chair of the Metabolic Study Group. We have a world-renowned faculty today for our uh, uh, webinar, so we have uh, Professor Wirt from Germany, who will speak about uh, osteogenesis imperfecta. Uh, Professor Jester from uh, the United Kingdom will speak about uh, MPS. Ismat Ghanem, uh, Professor Ghanem from Lebanon, will speak about uh, lengthening techniques in achondroplasia. Professor von Juvenhoven from the Netherlands will speak about the hand in apert syndrome. Professor Soldado from Spain will speak about upper limb problems in hyperlaxity syndromes. And Professor Abzug from the United States will speak about realignment techniques uh, in patients with hereditary exostosis. So now I would like to uh, invite Professor Wirt for the first presentation. Hello, everybody. I'm glad to be part of. Wait a moment. Where is it? I'm glad to be part of this um, faculty, and I'm talking about how and when to treat deformities and fractures of the upper limb in osteogenesis imperfecta. On the patient side, there are uh, acute problems such as multiple fractures and um, muscular forces and mild and silent fractures which generate silent deformities. The patient, um, generally wheelchair bound, needs uh, functional upper extremities for their independence, mobility and daily activities. Professor Borevers, I'm very sorry, your presentation is not shown. Now? Yes, excellent. Would you mind starting from the beginning, if possible, please? Okay, Thanks. so I'm sorry that uh, due to technical issues, uh, I wasn't uh, seen in the beginning. So I start again on how and when to treat deformities and fractures of the upper limb in osteogenesis imperfecta. So on the patient side, there are acute problems with multiple fractures and um, muscular forces and mild and silent fractures that generate deformity um, more silently. The patient, generally wheelchair bound, needs functioning upper extremities for their independence, mobility and daily activities. On the doctor's side, the fracture treatment um, is um, for humerus, elbow, forearm, very typical to what we see from other healthy patients. Deformity treatment may be very complicated both at the humerus and forearm. The most applied uh, treatment of um, up, uh, op treatment options for upper extremity fracture treatment are very similar to what we use uh, in other patients. In very young children, only bandages and early functional treatment um, are being used. We use diesel or Gilchrist slings. We can use long arm and short arm casts. Surgical therapy, according to up-to-date principle, is being used for uh, to achieve early functional treatment, more or less in older children and those with a higher activity grade. Fracture treatment of forearm and elbow is well known to what we use in all other patients as well, like in this patient with a forearm shaft fracture, a classical stabilization with intramedullary virus 
virus in um, Morote technique is used. And in this patient with a olecranon fracture, the very typical uh, treatment is applied as well by open reduction and tangent band, wire, uh, tangent band wiring. Uh, fracture treatment of humerus can be done by ascending and descending um, intramedullary devices such as flexible intramedullary nailing or K-virus. The problems here is um, that we uh, are dealing with um, problems of the medullary cavity. It may be obliterated or uh, not wide enough to accept um, um, one, more than one um, wire. There might, we would like to achieve primary stability. What about rotational stability? And with just the use of wires, there is no telescoping effect because it, it is a fixed length device. And this happens with a fixed length device over time, the patient and the humerus grows and fixation, fixation stays in place. So one option could be stay conservative and uh, see how things go. And the other option is primary uh, use of telescoping um, implants, um, like in this case. When we talk about upper limb deformity, we really enter difficult terrain because it is a very complicated um, and complex thing to, to, to deal with. This six-year-old boy with severe bilateral upper limb bone deform deformities does have a functional impairment, of course. And we know that functional uh, import, uh, impairment and, um, and deformity are well linked uh, uh, to each other. So the total deformity angle um, is uh, um, in line with the uh, self-care uh, um, scores and mobility scores. So the more deformed the arm, the, um, the less function there is. So that means def uh, deformity correction is a proper thing to do. And um, this is an example how we stabilize the left humerus after multiple fractures and uh, development of pseudarthrosis by um, wedge resection and intramedullary stabilization with a telescopic nail. Technical details are important to know. So personally, I like to start at the level of the apex and um, uh, drill and prepare the medullary cavity in a retrograde fashion. Um, and in the anti-grade fashion from the same level, I pre-cut the male part of the rod to the length needed, if, if that's uh, the only way to get the right length of the male part. Insert the pre-cut nail part in a retrograde and then anti-grade way, so first up and then down. Extend or adduct the arm to avoid interfering with the rotator cuff and the chromium, and then insert the femoral part top to bottom. Um, it is not a good idea to have a long male part st sticking um, um, out uh, at the top. Um, and if you try to manipulate, you may bend it so and, and it will, won't telescope. The uh, bone characteristics and choice of implant are crucial. Bone size and diameter, the intramedullary cavity, is it obliterated? That is a difficult thing to uh, deal with. And then the bone quality is much changed by bisphosphonate treatment or even denosumab. The, uh, the size of the epiphysis may be very small to accept a stable fixation. And an elongating rod uh, versus fixed length devices needs to be evaluated which one fits and which one is best. There are problems with this, uh, of course. Uh, here, both humeri were done, correction by several osteotomies quite well done on the right side, but the, proper, the, the upper fixation on the left side was insufficient. The um, rod migrated up, um, but remained asymptomatic. In the forearm, the correction is even more difficult. Here is a 10-year-old boy with a severe functionally um, effective the forearm deformity, which was stabilized by two distally inserted K-wires. Um, I like to use small K wires for this and uh, I use the blunt tip when there is an open medullary cavity. I use the sharp tip when there is a closed medullary cavity and try to drill each segment separately and put it uh, then together piece by piece. I use manual force rather than power drill and I insert K wires from opposite end to allow sliding if this is, is possible. So. 
There is a need for careful planning uh, of the numbers of the osteotomies, the size of the wires, and I usually start radius first. I come in from the distal radial end with a blunt tip. If the uh, medullary cavity is open, slide it through to the first um, apex, do the osteotomy, drill the segments, uh, um, and as I mentioned, and then um, put in the wire and straighten the radius first. I do the same with the ulna um, from the opposite direction in an ideal case. And this is how it looks after um, stra uh, straightening of this deformed forearm. The um, mid-term outcome uh, and the long-term outcome are pretty good. The patients are really satisfied with the, with the result. Um, and I want to mention that I think that uh, in this case, with a bilateral correction, two different methods of inserting the wires, the sliding technique, which was done on the left side, is superior, at least on the midterm um, uh, and on midterm. Not every problem can be solved, particularly in patients who get a lot of um, um, medication. Here is bisphosphonate treatment, followed by denosumab, followed by bisphosphonate, and it led, for whatever reason, to a loss of bone of both uh, humerus and forearm. Um, I try to fix the humerus. I'm not, uh, I'm, I don't know how I should uh, tackle the forearm yet. Um, it needs to be done sometime. But what we know is that improved arm function leads the patient to better um, um, independence because he can use, uh, he's stronger using his wheelchair, much more independent. And also, uh, they also acknowledge the stable uh, and straight for, uh, arms without getting fractures. They have improved function, increased auton autonomy, and I mentioned the wheelchair uh, situation and sometimes the use of, of, of um, crutches when walking short distances. This has been shown in um, several studies, uh, one from Kathleen Montpetit. Um, they found that the um, mobility skills and self-care skills are improved with a multidisciplinary, including orthopedic management of upper extremity problems. So the upper extremity is now in full focus in OI patients. Mildly and moderated, moderately affected patients require early functional fracture treatment. Severely affected patients demand for individuality, independence, self-selected mobility in the wheelchair and use of walking aids. Both surgical fracture treatment and deformity correction of the upper limb are very beneficial to all our eye patients. It is difficult and complex surgery, but it is worth it. Thank you very much. Greetings from Stuttgart. And I now hand over to uh, Andrea Jester. I'm sorry for the delayed start. Thank you very, very much for the introduction. I'm very pleased uh, to share our knowledge with the um, audience. I have no declarations of interest. What is mucopolysaccharidosis? So we are going to talk about MPS. It's a very, very rare disease. It's a multi-organ storage disease. And it's extremely rare. As you can see, one in 26,000 live births. Mucopolar saccharides are very long sugar molecules which are not completely uh, broken down in the body. They then aggregate in the, uh, in the cells and cause cell damage. Which forms of MPS do we know? Mainly Hurler, Hurler, Shea and Shea. There are three forms of the same condition MPS. One Hurler being the most severe one and Shea being the least severe one. Then Morbus Hunter, MPS2, San Filippo, Morchio, Maratolami, and Sly. Now, Hurle and Hurle Shea, this is the very typical picture how children look. And you see the very coarse hair, the very broad face, the wide mouth, and you see the very typical posture of the hands. And the main hand surgical problems these children have is carpal tunnel and clawing, and although as hand surgeons we know that this is an pediatrician use them, so we need to know it. MPS2, you see again the very typical posture of the fingers, named after Charles Hunter, 
very, very early description already in 1917. San Filippo, very, very rare. Our children die very early and usually they present late, late teenage years to us as hand surgeons, mainly because of very tight forearm flexes. And then we have MPS4 children, Molchio, very rare again, and they are completely different. They are not stiff, they are extremely floppy, they have no stability and no strength. So what are the hand and upper limb problems we see in MPS disorders? Mainly it's carpal tunnel syndrome in MPS 1, 2, 6 and 7. And then a lot of stiffness and only the MPS 4s and a bit the MPS 6 patients show laxity of the wrist, but all of them, all of them have a loss of hand function. And this is a very typical picture of a two-year-old uh, patient. And you see flexed PIP and DIP joint and extended MCP joints. It's very interesting that MCP joints do not flex in MPS. It's DIP and PIP and obviously the thumb. Now, when you get a child like that, what do you do? You, a lot of the children are mentally not very fit. Some are very, very, on a mentally very um, low status. So you have to observe the child, obviously. How do they interact with toys, food, and parents? And the very important questions, because you can't test children um, like you would test an adult with carpal tunnel syndrome. So you have to, to extrapolate. So you have to ask, has there been gnawing of the fingers lately? It means, is the child chewing on the fingers? Are they waking up in the middle of the night or in the night? Are they more clumsy? Are they slapping? Uh, their wrists or beating their hands. And then obviously you can do electrophysiology and ultrasound and you can do a patient assessment uh, questionnaire. It's very difficult because a lot of those patients will not be able to, to tell you that they're in pain. They can't tell you that they have pins and needles. You will see these bite marks on those fingers, on the index finger a lot. You may not see the thinner atrophy because they have very small, short hands um, so you will not be able to see the thin atrophy as you would otherwise, and they may wake during the night. Secure symptoms, obviously electrophysiology, but there is a, a significant number of false negatives, so beware. And we've started to, uh, to use ultrasound to, to show the median nerve compression. A lot of us think that maybe if you start the enzyme replacement therapy very early, that they will not need surgery. And that is unfortunately only the case if they start enzyme replacement straight after birth, and then they will uh, potentially not develop carpal tunnel problems. But if they start it later, let's say age two, then they will do a need surgery. So what are, we, uh, what are we dealing with? We have stiffness of the fingers, so this clawing. We have median nerve compression with pain and decreased hand function. And on top of that, we see this x-rays with very short bones um, and the changes. Now in our hospital, the principles are that carpal tunnel syndrome in MPS children should be decompressed very early. We do not wait. Uh, we don't split only the retinaculum, but we do proper big, big surgery. So it's not the place for keyhole surgery. And unless parents absolutely resist any post-operative exercises, the mental disability is not an indication not to do surgery. You have to do it because all children are in pain. The surgical technique is always a general anesthesia. It's a long incision, you'll see it in a second. We divide the flexor, the retinaculum, we identify the median nerve. We do a partial epinorectomy. We then do a complete tenosynovectomy of all FDS and FDP tendons, and we tend to take biopsies of the subsynovial conductive tissue. And here's a case of a three-year-old child with MPS1. And you see now when you split the uh, retinaculum flexorum that it's actually not very thickened. But you already see very funny yellow changes around the median nerve. And once you've done your epinorectomy, you see that the median nerve has this very typical significant hourglass deformity. And this is a three-year-old child, obviously. And now something very odd and very typical for MPS one and two and six uh, comes up 
that there's significant scar tissue around the tendons. So especially around the FDPs, there's significant scarring and you have to divide all of that scarring. So actually the median nerve compression is due to internal compression from the increased tendon and synovium diameter and not from the retinacle and flexorum. Uh, especially in the early stages, you will see trigger fingers and you have to always split an A1 and A3 pulley. There is a bit of a discussion of whether you have to remove an FDS slip to create more room. I tend not to do that because we do a significant uh, tennis and avectomy, but it's certainly not wrong to do it if you feel that it's necessary to create more room. So the intraoperative observations that we see is that the flexor retinaculum is not excessively thickened usually. The median nerve has an hourglass deformity. There is very mild uh, fibrosis in the sub sub subsynovial connective tissue around the FDS tendons, but excessive fibrosis around the FDP tendons. And the older the children are, the more excessive this concrete-like fibrosis is around the deep flexor tendons, which you actually have to remove. This is the clinical result in the child that we've seen. In his case, we've done only one hand because parents would have preferred that, but it's very nice because you see the operated against the non-operated hand and the success. So the result says there is an improved range of movement after extended approach versus a simple decompression. I can, um, I've done previously only the simple decompression and I switched very quickly to the extended um, approach many years ago. There is an improved range of mo motion in the PIP and DIP joints and the children have less uh, pain and other secondary symptoms such as waking and chewing. When to, to perform this type of surgery? as early as electrophysiology is delayed, and we start the electrophysiology pretty early after birth, um, six, 12 months of age. What happens after surgery? Daily exercises, usually done by the parents. We don't bring them in. They, they are double checked by the, our hand therapists. They assess them, but it's usually the parents who do that. Thank you very much. And I would like now to introduce Professor Ghanem from Lebanon. Well, uh... Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for the for the introduction. Uh, sorry, let me take this. Well, thank you very much for the introduction. I would like uh, first to thank uh, uh, the organizers of uh, the conference uh, for uh, of uh, this uh, webinar mainly Dr. Sebastian Farr and uh, Sunny for uh, being uh, very kind to us. Sunny, thank you so much. So why this topic? Why achondroplasia? And why lengthening of the upper limb in achondroplasia? So what is achondroplasia? Achondroplasia, as you all know, is a short stature. It is a rhizomelic short stature is a, a rhizomelic short stature, which means is characterized by a, an almost uh, satisfactory developing trunk, but short limbs, mainly the upper and the lower limbs. Sorry, it's not advancing. I don't know what's happening. Dr. Ghanem, let's us yes. quickly something. We remove you and we put it back and let's hope that it's okay. fixed like you can continue. Just one moment, Thank please. Thank you. Thank you.
I'm sorry, it's not moving. It must be some kind of technical problem. It's not moving because I have uh, an animation on the photo, but it's not moving. So unfortunately, there is some kind of technical problem. Are you able to still continue your presentation without the slides? No, no but you, no, no, maybe, no, I, I have to move on with the slides. It's uh, important to show photos and, and uh, x-rays. I don't know what's happening. Maybe someone will, uh, maybe we can move to the Q&A and, and or, or someone can give his talk uh, before and then I can probably fix this uh, this problem later on. We can do definitely so if um, the chairs of the webinar agree to that. Professor uh, Farr, would you agree that we go to the next speaker, uh, Dr. Van Nievenhofen's uh, talk? And in the meantime, Dr. Ganem tries to fix the technical problem. Yes, please continue with uh, Christiane, yes. Okay, if Dr. Van Nievenhofen is ready with her presentation, uh, Dr. Ganem, if you can, uh, we will stop your screen sharing. Um, oh, I think it's I, I think it's working now. It's working now. Okay, so we will continue then. If yeah, so rhizomelic short stature, you can see the difference between the length of the trunk and the length of uh, the upper limbs and the lower limbs. And when we say rhizomelic, you can see that there is a difference between the length of the arm and the length of the forearm. The shortening is mainly proximal. And this may interfere with the activities of daily living, mainly those uh, using upper limbs. Patients and the families have some cosmetic concerns, um, and uh, this may lead to some psychological repercussions as well. This making limb lengthening desirable. However, this lengthening remains controversial. In my 22 years of uh, personal experience, I had to operate and do a, a lengthening of the humerus in four patients with achondroplasia with eight uh, humeral lengthenings only. So how do we do it? This is a part of a four limb lengthening, which means that we need to lengthen uh, in a parallel manner, both upper limbs and both lower limbs. We start with both femurs first, followed by both humeri, and then followed by both tibia and fibula. Why at the upper limb we lengthen only the humeri and not the forearms? Because there is a, a true rhizomelic shortening of the upper limb, which means that there is a huge discrepancy, a significant discrepancy between the arm and the forearm, which is uh, in contradiction with what happens at the lower limbs. You can see that the difference in length between the thighs and the, and the uh, legs is not that big. So this lengthening is intended to improve function and cosmesis, mainly uh, those who relate the function related to uh, like uh, tying the, the, the shoe, shoe wear, putting on the shoes or personal hygiene. However, while planning this surgery, there are many considerations that should be taken into account. Uh, some of them are common to other limb lengthenings in achondroplasia. We all know that the healing is better in achondroplastic children versus non-achondroplastic children. And this is because of the, the transverse endochondral uh, growth. We also know that uh, while putting a, a traction, distraction across the joint and across the growth blade, this may lead to early joint degeneration, early growth arrest. This is one of the reasons why aged surgery should be delayed to more than 10 years and preferably around the 12 years or so. There are other considerations, mainly specific to the upper limb in achondroplasia. Some of them are anatomic, as you can see. This is a lateral view of the humerus of an achondroplasia patient. You can see that the slope of the distal humerus is increased as compared to normal uh, children, normally developing children. And you can see that this leads to a flexion contracture of the elbow and should be taken into consideration while planning to insert the distal screws. Other associated anomalies and deformities contributing to the worsening of the flexion contraction of the elbow is dislocation of the radial head. There's also something specific to the upper limbs in achondroplasia when we compare them to the lower limbs is that healing after lengthening of the upper limbs of the humerus mainly is better 
than when uh, we perform lengthening of the lower limbs in the same patient uh, uh, with achondroplasia, with a healing in the index significantly better in uh, the humerus than in the lower limbs. So how do we do it technically? I personally prefer to use a unilateral external fixator because it has been demonstrated in my personal experience and in the literature that it is at least as effective as and easier and safer than circular frames in the humerus. The surgery should be performed under a fluoroscopy. The proximal two pins should be uh, inserted percutaneously, strictly lateral, and the two distal pins, I personally prefer to insert them open in order to make sure that I don't miss or have a, a, a bad grip on the bone uh, in such a short humerus. We do not have to reinsert something that we missed to, to insert it well the first time. The osteotomy is preferably proximal because it has been shown also that distal osteotomy may be associated with an increased risk of radial nerve injury and worsening of elbow fracture contracture following the lengthening. Well, if, if we stick to the principles of this lengthening, we may achieve an average safe lengthening of about 52 to 56 percent, which is equivalent to 9 to 10 centimeters in such a very short humerus. This definitely leads to improvement of daily activities and uh, with, uh, without any alteration of shoulder and elbow motion and stability. There are, however, some inherent complications to this technique. Some of them are intraoperative and short-term, and other are uh, uh, long-term. The intraoperative and short term are mainly similar are, are similar to those found in uh, le uh, humeral lengthening for non achondroplasia patients. We can have a pin tract infection. Uh, we can have a radial neuropraxia. Uh, uh, we can have also some bowing and uh, and the weak regenerate. And all this will be dealt with accordingly and may not alter the final treatment outcome. The long-term complications, however, are either non-union or delayed union. This is also encountered in non-achondroplasia patients, but in this, uh, in this category of patients, uh, it uh, occurred mainly when we had a, a bad alignment of bony fragments intraoperatively and uh, uh, intraoperative with a bad apposition of, uh, of bony extremities. The worsening of elbow flexion contracture was observed mainly uh, in uh, where, where also the fragments were malaligned, especially if the osteotomy was distal. Psychological intolerance was observed mainly in older children greater than 15 years of age, and uh, this is mainly in, in patients uh, who had complications following uh, their surgery. So my take-home messages are, first of all, consider lengthening of the humerus as part of a whole package. Do not isolate it. It should be part of a four-limb parallel lengthening. The, the scheduled surgeries are uh, included in a heavy program and are to be well discussed with the patient and the family. Aged surgery is better when it is above 12 years of age and below 15 years of age, and psychological counseling and support are necessary because this disease and its treatment are associated with many psychological issues. The benefit-risk ratio of uh, humoral lengthening is favorable, provided surgical tips and tricks uh, has been respect, have been respected. Osteotomy should be proximal, and the complications are usually manageable and do not alter the final outcome. I would like to uh, send my special thanks to Dr. Julio de Pablos, uh, who uh, uh, generously shared his experience with me and sent me some of his cases. Thank you very much for your attention. I would like uh, now to uh, pass the screen to Dr. Ralph Sackers, who will uh, moderate the Q&A uh, session. <clears throat> yes, thank you for the first three speakers. Excellent talks. Um, we would like to dis have some discussion on these topics for the next 15 minutes. Um, and I would like to start with a question from the audience is uh, to uh, Dr. Jester, do you use regular ultrasound and EMG in follow-up? No, I don't. I don't. 
Um, the reason being is uh, it, that I do I see the children clinically. I will see them every six to twelve months because we are a part of the mucopolysaccharidosis annual checkup clinic. So the hand surgeons will be called. And if I have clinically the impression that they're good, that they're not biting, that they are not waking, then I'm happy. If I have the impression that they may have a recurrence, then um, I will obviously then double check with electrophysiology. We shouldn't forget that electrophysiology is not the nicest of all investigations and some children actually hate it. Thank you very much. Um... I have a question. How does the uh, clinical and the electrophysiological uh, examination outcomes relate, uh, in your opinion? Or is it your... So, so in those children, we've done a couple of children where we've actually measured the electrophysiology afterwards, and they don't get, uh, they do not get a restitutio ad integrum. So they they are not fully recovered a lot of times. But the clinical picture that they don't wake up, that they have much better um, functionality and less pain it seems to be sufficient. Okay, thank you. Any other questions from um, Yolos Ismat Garab? You have a question about flexor Dr. Sackers, can I ask Dr. Jester a question on that, please? Um, yeah, of Dr. course. Dr. Jester? Do you think that they don't get better because there's true damage to the median nerve at the carpal tunnel, or do you think that there's other compression more proximal and we don't necessarily take away the tenosynovium? synovium? For example, we are all familiar with pronator syndrome, and there's obviously tenosynovium synovium in that region more proximal to the median nerve than the carpal tunnel. Just curious on your thoughts on, are we missing the picture? I think we sometimes are missing a little, the picture a little bit. It starts already that we are not always measuring the ulnar nerve um, down here either, and we are not always measuring the posterior tibial nerve in the tarsal tunnel. So that's the, the that's the first time that we may miss the 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 the, the picture here. Secondly, um, it might be, it might be. Um, I'll take that into account next time, and then I'll ask our neurophysiologists afterwards to measure it higher up as well. Um, not sure. Christian, do you, you do that as well? What, what are your thoughts on that? Um, uh, we do a lot of uh, uh, EMGs, uh, uh, at least our uh, neurologist does. Uh, children don't like it, so I don't like to do it uh, to them. Um, and indeed, you, there is a lot of scarring in the nerve itself, uh, and uh, that doesn't disappear after uh, the release. Uh, so you can do repeatedly uh, an EMG, but you will see uh, a couple tunnel syndrome without symptoms after a couple tunnel release in the MPS patients. And probably it's because of the scarring. There's, there's also one, we, I'm not sure whether you guys have ever taken uh, nerve specimens. Um, there is one um, publication where they've taken a nerve specimen from the leg and they found that there is accumulation of glycosaminoglycans also within the nerve. So not yeah. only around the nerve, but also within the nerve, which we are obviously not addressing. Okay, I would like to continue mm. with a question from the audience to Dr. Ghanem. How do you correct the flexion deformity of the humerus while well, you make a proximal osteotomy in the monorail? Question yes, from sir. the audience. This is a very good question. Uh, so the, the, uh, I, I, I agree that I performed once a distal osteotomy just at the apex of the deformity uh, of uh, where there's a meet, uh, ju the junction between the diaphysis, the shaft, and the uh, distal humeral slope. But uh, this was associated with a delayed with a delayed uh, union, with a delayed union, and uh, I, I must say that we can correct this by doing a proximal osteotomy, not very proximal, and by displacing the fragments but keeping them in touch for a long period before starting lengthening. It this improves uh, flexion contracture of the elbow a little bit. I mean, uh, not a little bit. It improves it, but it doesn't correct it fully. Thank you. Another question from the audience for Thomas Wirt. Um, how did you perform the pre-op diagnostics? CT analysis for three-dimensional deformities, do you use that? No, never. 
never. It is just a clinical um, and radiological um, um, diagnostics. I, I don't use um, any other uh, modality. Thank you. Another question from the audience. Can we do lengthening for the humerus and not touching the lower limbs in a chondroplasia? Or yeah, well, this is a very good question. Well, depending, this depends honestly on what is what what the patient patient wants and what the parents want. If the problem is mainly uh, uh, personal hygiene and uh, daily activities using the upper limbs, someone may do it. But then lengthening of the upper limbs should not be excessive. Well, we can lengthen the humerus like four or five or four or five centimeters, but not nine or ten centimeters. Uh, yes, we can do it, of course. Thank you. Another question for, for uh, Andrea Jester. Do you have uh, problems with the ulnar nerve? This is also a question from the audience. Um, and how is your approach there? So it's very interesting because we've, in the last 12 years, we've always measured the ulnar nerve as well, and we've not yet had to decompress it. And I can only assume this is because actually it is an internal compression from the significant amount of tenosynovium, scar tenosynovium, which is putting pressure on the on the median nerve, because there are nine tendons uh, around this one poor little median nerve, which can all scar. And there's um, it, the, the anatomy is different for the ulnar nerve, but actually it is very similar again for the tarsal tunnel. So, and we have had several children with tarsal tunnel syndrome in MPS. Thank you. Another question from the audience. Um, how to convince parents and patients to lengthen all four limbs in a chondroplasia? Okay. Well, this is a very good question. I, I would ask the question differently. How to convince them not to do the surgery? Uh, the question is, is different because, you know, it's a big task to do lengthening of uh, four limbs. Uh, this is not easy. It keeps sometimes the child away from school for a long period of time. Uh, if we don't count the, uh, uh, the, the, the pain and the, uh, uh, the infection rate and the problems uh, that necessitate uh, going back into the hospital and into the operating room to address them. So if there's, uh, in my personal opinion, if uh, we do not have a strict need, either psychological, one of the patients one of, the, one of my patients threatened me that she will kill herself if we do not do surgery on her. So that's why we, I operated on her. She was 14. She wanted to jump from the 10th floor. So that's why we operated on her. Uh, so if there is no strict cosmetic need uh, with uh, psychological, severe psychological uh, influ uh, repercussion, uh, and if there is no strict functional need, I don't think we need just, I mean, to do them just to have... Uh, uh, a, a just a good good length of uh, the four limbs. Thank you. Uh, and another question for you from the audience: What do you think about plating after lengthening of the humerus? Well, this is uh, this is a, a good question. We can either use a plate or use a, a nail. In fact, in one of my patients with a delayed union, the one on whom I uh, I, I performed the distal humeral osteotomy to correct the flexion contracture. Uh, well, the, the pseudo flexion contracture of the elbow, in fact, it was a flexion, uh, an apparent flexion contracture. I had a delayed union, so for the delayed union, I had to uh, uh, remove the, they, they, were, they were fed up with the external fixator, so I kept the external fixator for, for a while. I put an anterior plate uh, and uh, then a, a bone graft and removed the external fixator. Thank you. Um... I have some sort of same question for Thomas Weert. Do you ever use uh, combinations of pins and plates in the humerus for uh, osteogenesis imperfecta? I mean, it has been described in the literature. For me, there is just one indication to use uh, supplementary plating for those patients. Uh, and this is the case when there is a, a lack of rotational stability um, after your correction. Um, I'm trying to do my osteotomies with um, drilling and with a chisel, so I have irregular um, edges 
And when I straighten a, a bent bone, I get enough pressure to make this rotationally stable. But if that's not the case, I use a supplementary, maybe four hole um, a plate. Thank you. And do you also have a, uh, prefer a certain order in which you operate in arms? I mean, upper arm for uh, the humerus first or the radius and ulna first? Can you comment on that? I yeah, I like humerus first and then forearm. I have done forearm only if requested. I have done several patients with humerus only because forearm deformity wasn't enough, wasn't bad enough to do. But if there is a if it, it is a complex situation, I start with the humerus. And sometimes I start in the same sessions. I do the humerus, then do the forearm one side and another session the other side. Uh, Sunny, how much time do we have still for this question? No, I would move forward to Dr. Van Nierenhofen's okay. talk. Okay, I would like to thank everyone for the questions and the answers, and we move forward to Dr. Van Nierenhofen, please. Thank you. First of all, thank you for uh, inviting me to uh, this uh, this webinar. I'm going to uh, talk a little bit on the now I have to proceed. Yeah, uh, talk a little bit on uh, the Apert's hands. Um, they are well known to have a cranium facial and hand problems uh, because uh, this is uh, the most visible anomaly in uh, the Apert's, but often one forgets that they also got shoulder, elbow, lower limb uh, deformities as well. So please take, uh, pay uh, attention to that as well. Uh, furthermore, they have a, a lower than normal in intelligence with uh, hearing and visual impairment that all these impairments uh, will influence their participation in daily life and maxim uh, maximizing their uh, hand ability is uh, therefore very uh, important. Uh, so this talk will be about uh, surgery, about technique, but also on uh, how they do, actually. Um, I'm not going to talk about hands only. Uh, as I explained, it's not only the hands. Uh, the feet, they gave complaints in 65 over 65% uh, with uh, regard to pressure sores and a higher total and forefoot pressure. And uh, what's good to know is that the long bones in the apex will grow into one block and diminishing actually um, the flexibility of the, the forefoot and hind foot. And one of the uh, nasty problems is the bulge under the foot uh, because of a long protruding metatarsal, which are mostly, mostly the second and third. Um, so I will take you quickly to, to a very easy operation in which you can help them. Um, uh, you can uh, address uh, the bulge by uh, doing, uh, doing an oblique osteotomy of the involved metatarsal and then put them in a cast for three weeks and have them work on, on it uh, directly. Uh, it's a very easy uh, 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 operation. It's, uh, uh, this is less effort um, and uh, they go from only in a wheel wheelchair to walking at school um, and it gives them a lot of freedom. So less effort, big advantage for the children. Uh, however, they still have to wear special shoes. So let's talk hands. Uh, there are three types. Um, they've uh, got a, uh, uh, it's according to Upton, however, it's a, a different shade of gray. Um, and uh, it's good to realize that Somebody is texting me. I'm going to put out my phone. Um, it's good to realize that it's the different shades of gray. So type one is called the spade hand, where you've got a thumb and the first web, and the second, third, and fourth finger are in a syndactyly. Um, and there is a... Um, a, a, a uh, and the, the little finger is, uh, is uh, uh, separate and can be flexed. If you look at the type 2, the mitten hand, uh, it ha is more severe and the uh, little finger is uh, attached to the fourth finger. 
and this is the last one, the type three, is the rosebud hand and it's uh, uh, conjoined together with um, hardly any anatomy visible anymore. Uh, it's not only the bone that is involved or the syndactyly, uh, the children also don't have normal intrinsic muscles, uh, they are hyperplastic, the extrinsic muscles are a kind of a plate, you don't have uh, a division of the uh, deep flexors and superficial flexors um, and tendons and the arteries and nerves are all around. However, they never gave me any problem with vascularity or sen uh, uh, sensation while doing desynactylization. So it's not only the bone that is involved. Uh, these are the clinical features. You can find that back. And uh, if you look at the treatment goals, you've got, uh, uh, you would like to have three or four fingers. You can imagine that in a rosebud, having four fingers is very difficult. You'd like to have a straight and long uh, thumb, uh, a sufficient first web, a straight little finger, and stable, stable skin in the webs. And most of the children will have uh, um, uh, an apprehension with the thumb to the index finger or to the, from the thumb to the uh, little finger. So there are a lot of uh, treatment uh, schedules available. This one is uh, in a chapter in an elegan. Uh, uh, I wrote it together with Professor Hovius a long time ago, but it changed in the meantime. Uh, and there are uh, a lot of personal preferences. Uh, so today I will show you my nowadays preference. It's also a lot about logistics and waiting lists, etc. what you want to do. So what I'll do, uh, uh, in a, in a child younger than six months, I'll always do both hands, do a thumb straightening, do the widening of the first web. I'll do a second and fourth web desynectalization and do an osteotomy uh, sinostosis of the uh, uh, end phalanx of the third and the fourth uh, finger. I will show you later on. And then uh, at an age of nine to 12 months, I will do uh, both hands again. I will do the third web desynactalization, and if necessarily, uh, I'll do the rest uh, over again. And that might be necessary, especially in the type three uh, rosebud hands. Uh, with regard to straightening the thumb, I will do a dome osteotomy. It's very difficult to uh, to uh, show that uh, in intraoperative pictures, so I made a drawing in the middle. Uh, uh, you see the meta, uh, metacarpal, uh, the basal phalanx, it's a delta kind of phalanx, and then you've got the, the end phalanx. Uh, I'll do a dome osteotomy and uh, turn the, um, uh, uh, the end phalanx straight, but before that you will have to uh, release the muscles from the uh, uh, thena muscles that are not attached to the basal phalanx, but to the end phalanx radial side. So I will remove it, uh, remove a big strip, and then uh, do the osteotomy. With regard to the widening of the first web, there are a lot of flaps out there. And uh, to my opinion, it depends a little bit on the type of hand. So in a type one, I would probably use a jumping jack, and sometimes you even don't need uh, a, a, a widening. In a type two, I would do a cloverleaf uh, type dorsal flap or a large V flap, and you can see that in the right uh, top corner. Um, or I'll, in a, and in a type three, I will do a big dorsal rotation advancement flap, as is shown in the other uh, photographs, uh, when there is a rosebud uh, and a uh, or a large V flap, and it also depends on the severity of uh, the rosebud or type three uh, hand. And as I said, uh, they're all different shades of uh, uh, gray. And when going for desynectalization, uh, except for uh, a lot of flaps that you can use, there uh, is also a technique that uh, is uh, introduced uh, by Rolf Habenich uh, from Hamburg, um, he uses it in the primary operation, and uh, it's a little bit of uh, fiddling around like the Meccano. I don't know if there are all, uh, the all the people will know what I mean uh, by Meccano. Uh, you can use it, and what it 
does it it widens uh, uh, the the space between especially the sec the third and fourth finger so you got a lot of skin so it helps in creating the skin uh, you've got a lot of complications uh, often there's still a, a full thickness skin graft needed and uh, uh, you can see that there are very spiky um, material material in the hand so if you've got a very young child you have to protect that and they can't use their hands uh, for a long time. So I preferably use it in the older patients uh, where they didn't dare to do a decent dactylization. So my preference is the, the good old fashioned decent dactylization of the second and third, a uh, fourth web um, uh, at the first time with big V uh, flaps from the dorsal side. I'll do that at an age of uh, three to six months, and that is a little bit dependent on uh, craniofacial operations. Um, what I don't do, it's not necessary in this case, but if necessary uh, for certain hands, I don't do Bukramko flaps. These are the flaps that are on the tip of the finger, and um, uh, I don't like them because they flatten out and you get ugly fingertips. Uh, and when you just um, uh, have it uh, uh, healed by secondary intention, then you get a nicely rounded uh, fingertip. So I'll do the V flaps, no cloverleaf flaps, and if I've got an easy uh, type one, I'll do all webs uh, at one time. So in the second stage, mostly it's three months after the first operation, I will do a decent actualization of the third web, Again, no uh, uh, Bukramko flaps, I explained to you why, and if uh, there is an indication, I do a correction of the thumb and a correction of the first web. And especially in the type 3, it's necessary to do the first web uh, uh, widening a couple of times. Um, what I do since, I think, uh, I think 10 years now, is an osteotomy of the middle and ring finger during the first uh, operation. Um, so I'll do, uh, I don't do a separation, I only do, uh, with, with a tiny sizzle, I will go in between uh, the, 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 the third and the fourth finger, uh, detaching the bony connection between the, uh, the two, those two fingers, uh, and in that way they release, and during growth in, those, in the next three months, uh, they will straighten out a little bit. And here you can see it's more V-shaped, and this is the same patient three months later on, and you've got uh, a broader nail, it straightens the finger, you've got a little bit more pulp, and it makes the second stage a lot more easier. Uh, lastly, um, uh, this, uh, uh, this is what I extremely like. Uh, as you know, you need a lot of skin grafts. I didn't talk about that because of time. Uh, you need a lot of skin grafts and it needs to heal. Uh, what I introduced in Rotterdam is a technique by uh, uh, Guy Fouché. Actually, uh, Stephen Hobie has introduced that. It's on the uh, top left uh, photograph is Guy and Stephen together. Uh, so we call it the Guy Fouché bandage. Um, and uh, top left, uh, below left, I uh, visited uh, Michael Tonkin in Sydney. And he just left the bandage on for a couple of weeks. And I thought when it is able in the bush in Australia, it's definitely possible in the cold weather in the Netherlands. So a skin graft takes six weeks to, uh, to, to heal. So I leave this bandage on for six weeks, even in April, and we've, it shows uh, great results. So I prefer this bandage. So this is a bandage on for two uh, for six weeks uh, on two arms, uh, and after that they uh, it's uh, being removed. Uh, a couple of years ago we checked 40 APA patients on how they do, and actually uh, to uh, uh, they they can't do everything, but they extremely enjoy the things they can do. Um, uh, so please uh, take notice of that. Uh, I love Apex children. Uh, they are great. Uh, they are almost always very happy, even the, the teenagers. 
so these were the first steps because this is only the first couple of operations and a lot of operations to go, not only craniofacial, but also on the, the hands, fingers and feet. Uh, so give those feet attention as well and the rest of the body. Um, operate together with the craniofacial specialist if possible and uh, the, use the techniques. Uh, uh, those are dependent on the type of hand you have and on the experience you have. Don't start with a type 3 if you never have operated an apex. Uh, and you need a lot of patience because it takes a lot of time, two hands, uh, a decent activation and uh, putting in all those uh, skin grafts. Uh, they ask for patients. And with regard to participation, as I already said, they enjoy uh, the things they can do. And uh, don't forget, they need a lot of corrections. I only uh, mentioned uh, the ones that uh, will give them uh, a thumb and four fingers or three fingers, but there is, are a lot of operations like correction osteotomies you can do later in life. So thank you for your attention. And now I would like to uh, introduce the next speaker. Uh, hello. <laughs> Dr. Francisco Soldado. Hello. Hi. So, <laughs> thank you. So I'm happy to be part of this uh, panel. Um, so, <clears throat> there are many deformities or instabilities related to hyperlaxity. The, mo the most common is the shoulder, but we are not going to talk about the shoulder. But then you can find, for example, a dorsal, MP, a, um, a subluxation. Um, rarely, these deformities requ require surgery. And basically, we are going to talk about the uh, elbow postlateral instability. We will talk a little bit about the swan neck deformity, trapezium metrocarpal instability, and uh, radiocarpal or midcarpal uh, instability in, in these uh, patients. Um, elbow posterior lateral rotator instability, um, the patient can uh, complain about feeling of instability or repeated in, uh, dislocation, but it's rare to have these this, uh, x-rays because when the patient get to the emergency room, it's already uh, reduced. Um, the diagnosis has, uh, can be done by the um, chair test, the chair test, and you, you can see that there is a sub posterior subluxation of, of the radial head. The pivot shift test normally is uh, negative. And it, it, in the MRI, you, you, the purpose of the MRI is not checking the ligaments, but it's very difficult to, to evaluate them. But if you do in supination and extension, you can see this uh, subluxation of the radial, the radial head. And then the pivot shift test it can be positive uh, under anesthesia, as you can see here, the, the dislocation occurs in uh, supination and extension, and you can also objectivize this uh, phenomenon in the fluoroscopy. And the, the surgery, the technique is very similar to the adult. Uh, so distally, you uh, to get the isometry, you put the, the tendon graft in the supinator tubercle. But proximally, as you have uh, the physis, you have to go proximal to the physis to the soft tissue and the periosteum. But you, you get nice uh, stabilis stabilization, as you can see in this uh, video. So this is a uh, case of a child treated with this uh, technique and the normalization of the um, um, chair. Uh, test. You can do also a, a push-up test which, uh, in supination, which is the, the same. Uh, Swan neck 
finger deformity is really, really common, but again, rarely needs surgery. And the indication is when you have a, a triggering, like in this uh, middle finger. So if that happens, uh, you can do uh, surgery. So in in that case, triggering is occurs in the annular and the fifth finger. So we, we do this surgery with the DFDS slip technique. So you take the ulnar um, slip and you put it surrounding the the periosteum under the Grayson uh, ligament, and you keep the the joint flex around 30 degrees. And this is the result after uh, surgery. Uh, so she's really happy with the uh, operative fingers, but now <laughs> she has, pro um, let's say, cosmetic problems with the middle and uh, index fingers. So she wants also uh, to have the same surgery in these uh, digits. Uh, trapezium metacarpal instability is also very, uh, common in, in hyperlax uh, children. But again, normally it's not painful. When it becomes painful, which is rare, uh, you can do surgery. And the instability is, uh, uh, if you consider the first metacarpal, is not in the sagittal plane, but, but in the front, frontal plane. And you can see it clinically or also um, fluoroscopically, fluoroscopically, okay. And uh, it, when you examine surgically this uh, joint, this is real. This is really uh, the, the the capsule is really really uh, thin. Okay, and so this is a uh, case of uh, symptomatic uh, trapezium metacarpal instability, and this is uh, after doing the the a little layer tendon plasty, ligament, ligament plasty. And uh, so you take the, the FCR and you detach it proximally, you take it distally, you do a tunnel in the uh, metacarpal and you do this uh, loop uh, using also the uh, APB, uh, the APL tendon. And this is the and this is a radiological radiological result. And you, you are afraid about um, doing a stiff a stiff joint, but normally this is not a problem. You can see that you preserve the the, the motion in the in that patient. There was a Kapanji ten uh, motion, and uh, and you solve the the pain. Okay, and finally this is. Uh, common, but the, the patients that do not uh, complain about, I mean, they don't have pain and the, for them this is normal. So you have uh, uh, mid-carpal or avocarpal uh, instability. In a very few patients, they, they feel not comfortable, they feel uh, like painful or uncomfortable, and you can do surgery. And the surgery is, uh, what, what you really do is be because the, the the capsule is quite thick, you you do a, um, a reefing of the of a cap, capsule. You cut the capsule, you overlap the capsule, you suture, and you, you do like a kind of um, scar, uh, limiting the the motion and uh, and um, controlling the symptoms. In this case, the patient is very happy, but now you can see that there is a residual volar subluxation of symptomatic, but he's uh, happy with the result. And that's all, thank you. And, and next, uh, Professor Apsuk uh, from Baltimore, and uh, a great friend of mine, we will talk about MHE and the forearm. Uh, Okay, uh, great. Uh, thank you, Francisco, for the introduction, and thank you to the uh, chairman for organizing the webinar and inviting me. Uh, so truly a uh, 
international event beyond Europe, obviously Lebanon and the US as well. So thank you. I have no relevant disclosures or conflicts of interest. So MHE, I think we all recognize as a genetic disorder uh, with the two genes listed on the various chromosomes. Uh, we all know that it's autosomal dominant with variable penetrance. And these osteochondromas can enlarge during growing years and a small percentage of them can become malignant in adulthood. And uh, we all just need to be cognizant of that. So in the upper extremity, the forearm is the most common joint affected. Children can have loss of motion, bowing as you see here, shortening of their forearm segment. Certainly these can lead to cosmetic concerns and functional limitations as well. There's a wide range of involvement. On the left, you can certainly see a younger child with minimal involvement uh, from the osteochondromas. And on the right, we can see a severely deformed forearm. The physical examination of these children is straightforward. Uh, the mass is present or non-tender, they're fixed, and they're hard adjacent to the bone. There may be an overlying bursa that has some synovial fluid in it that can uh, lead to a little trickiness, but uh, quite often the diagnosis is relatively straightforward. And pertains to the forearm itself, there will be decreased range of motion, particularly forearm rotation, and the children will often lack elbow extension. Regarding imaging, the diagnosis is straightforward with plain radiographs. You can look for a mass that has continuity with the medullary canal, and the cortices are contiguous with the medullary canal as well, with the um, remainder of the bone. Uh, if there is concern for malignant transformation, that is when an MRI should be obtained. The surgical indications for addressing MHE in the form include pain, irritation of the adjacent structures, decreased range of motion, which is much more common with the interposed osteochondroma, as you see here, an excess dosis has caused shortening or substantial angulation in the forearm. The shortening is most common in the distal ulna, where you can have relative radial lengthening and bowing, again, as you see in this radiograph. Furthermore, there can be radial head subluxation or dislocation, and the carpus may be ulnarly translocated. The goals of the surgery should be to decrease pain, maintain the forearm integrity, and improve range of motion and function, and lastly, uh, we should ideally improve cosmesis. The surgical options include excision of an isolated osteochondroma, osteochondroma excision combined with an ulnar lengthening with or without a radial corrective osteotomy, and this procedure can be performed in one or two stages, or creation of a one-bone forearm. Excision of an isolated osteochondroma is a straightforward procedure that has excellent results and a very low complication rate. A direct approach to the osteochondroma is performed, in this case, for an ulnar osteochondroma, a direct approach to the ulna. You can incise the overlying bursal sac, fully expose the mass, which has the cauliflower-like appearance, dissect subperiosteally to the underlying cortex, utilize the curved or straight osteotome to remove the exostosis at the base flush with the remaining cortex of the bone, place bone wax to limit some bleeding, and perform an osteotomy if needed to correct any angular deformity at the same setting. So here's that same case, the ulnar osteochondroma, simple excision, direct exposure, leaving room to get your osteotome in. Here the osteotome is going to be placed flush with the remaining cortex to remove the oxostosis, and then any remaining pieces can be removed with a ronjor and the arm closed without any difficulty. What about once there's limited forearm rotation present or a more advanced case? In these situations, surgery may be required of both the radius and the ulna. These are much more complex cases and have, therefore have a higher complication rate. These surgeries can be performed in a single stage where you can perform an acute lengthening and a corrective radius osteotomy, or my preference is to perform these procedures in two stages where you can apply an external fixation device to lengthen the ulna and perform your corrective radiosteotomy, either at the time of the fixator application or at the time of the removal of your lengthening device. The single stage procedure is performed uh, by performing a closing wedge osteotomy of the radius proximal to the physis. This technique utilizes a volar trans FCR approach. You can stabilize your osteotomy once they've been performed with a plate or K wires, depending on the age of the child. And then you can utilize the excised bone as morselized bone graft for your ulnar lengthening site. The ulnar lengthening, again, utilizes the same direct approach we discussed earlier, where you excise any exostoses that are there. You can perform a Z osteotomy and distract the ulnar to your desired length. 
and then stabilize the ulna with the plate and screws as uh, you're able to, and utilizing that morselized graft and the defects. If needed, you can utilize an intraoperative fixator to aid in your distraction. But again, my preference is to perform a two-stage procedure. In the first stage, you'll apply the owner external fixation device, perform your owner corticotomy once your device has been applied. Um, typically, this is performed in a met proximal metaphysis as your ideal location. You'll then lengthen your ulna approximately a millimeter a day after a short period of resting. And during this time, you need to ensure your child maintains active and passive motion of the elbow, wrist, and hand. So the application of the external fixation is applied, again, with a direct approach to the ulna. You'll place a uniplanar external fixation device for deformities that require distraction only or those that are treated with acute angular correction. If you need to perform a multiplanar angular deformity correction, then you should apply a multiplanar external fixator. During the second stage, after your lengthening, you can remove your external fixation device once that desired length is reached and your regenerate bone is mature, as you see here. Again, your radius osteotomy, as you see here, uh, drawn out in our preoperative planning, can be performed at the time of application of your external fixation device or at the time of the removal. So here's a case example of a 13-year-old with progressive left forearm deformity. You can see here, as I mentioned, the planned radial osteotomy sites, as well as the exostosis. Um, you'll see the bowing of the distal radius, as well as the ulnar translocation that we discussed. This was performed a two-stage procedure with application of the unilateral um, external fixation device, uniplanar, sorry, excuse me. Uh, and you can see the osteotomies performed, and in this case, due to the child's young age, fixed with K-wires. Here's the lengthening with the regenerate bone present. And then here's the uh, final product. Again, I see a little bit of persistent bowing of the ulna, but overall marked improved alignment of the forearm. And here are his clinical photographs demonstrating his forearm rotation and wrist motion. One bone forearm procedure is a salvage procedure. This is performed to eliminate pain and or instability with forearm rotation. In this case, you can remove a prominent or painful radial head at the time of the one bone forearm creation. This is typically reserved for severe deformity cases, but not always. The procedure is performed utilizing a volar approach to the mid forearm. Your radius osteotomy is performed in the distal third of the radius and your ulnar osteotomy is performed in the proximal third of the ulna. You can apply your plate to the radial aspect of the radius and rotate the radius and plate to line up with the ulna and you will secure your plate to the ulna in your desired amount of forearm pronation. The proximal radius can then be utilized as an onlay graft with or without fixation as the pronator teres will hold it in close proximity or you can add a plate to increase your fusion mass. Here's a case example of a 14-year-old skateboarder. You can see the severe deformity distally and very limited forearm rotation that's already present. And this is all due to that exostosis in a distal third, as we discussed earlier. So here's our volar trans uh, FCR approach to the radius and ulna. We remove the exostosis as we've discussed. We will make our radius osteotomy in a distal third. And then we can rotate it to the ulna where we had made our osteotomy in a proximal third. We will place the form in our desired amount of pronation and then fix it with plate and screw fixation. And here's the final product. And the clinical photographs, we can go from this deformity to a child with a straight forearm that's more functional. Again, he had very limited forearm rotation preoperatively and continued to have so, obviously, postoperatively. As we mentioned, complications can occur. These can include pin tract infections, delayed osteous union, particularly of regenerate bone, non-union at osteotomy sites, persistent pain or decreased range of motion, despite overall improvement in alignment and malignant transformation. I wanna end leaving you with a reminder of why we do all of the surgeries we discussed today. Uh, and Elena reminded me of uh, two scenarios. Um, one, that she is still a child, and we can see her going through this process 
and recovering well during the time period, but we always need to remember our patient behind the disease. And then as Elena pointed out, when she won this drawing competition, this is all a team effort. It's not just us as the surgeons, but we are part of a larger team in healthcare and not us as the surgeons are the heroes, but the whole team is the hero for these children. So with that, I will uh, thank everyone and uh, I enjoy the discussion. So thank you everybody for the great presentations. We're going to start uh, with the Q&A. So I have a first question actually for all of the speakers. Um, regarding the post-operative pain management. So the question is, are local regional catheter techniques used? So we may start with uh, Christiane. What is your experience? Do you use any catheters or just local anesthesia? Please comment. Uh, we do. Uh, it's a single shot uh, plexus uh, block uh, preoperatively. I think 99 of the cases and when we do a uh, bigger OR like the radial uh, dysplasia etc uh, we would do a catheter but uh, for the rest we don't actually need it. Uh, most of our patients are in daycare um, so they, and pain is not the, the biggest problem. Francisco, for your biggest surgeries for wrist instability and uh, for uh, most likely for finger surgery not, but for wrist instability, do you use uh, just a block or any catheter for the first period? No, we we, uh, we do an in, um, subcutaneous injection and a subcutaneous anesthetic injection. So for soft tissue, we don't we normally don't don't ask for a block a plexus block. That's my experience too, Josh. For your biggest surgery, like uh, double osteotomies or single bone procedures, do you use catheters or do you just advise for a single shot block? Yeah, we do not utilize the catheters, uh, just a single shot block. And actually, in my experience, quite often we don't even need the block. As Christiane mentioned, a lot of the, particularly the younger children, do not experience tons of pain and they can be well managed with multimodal pain management. Uh, medication, including uh, anti-inflammatories. I'm not afraid to give these children Toradol um, and anti-inflammatories in conjunction with a small short course of uh, opioid as needed. Okay, thank you. Next question for Christiane. What is your schedule in the treatment of type 3 hands? Does it well, differ I, from the, the algorithm you showed us or what what are the well, specific I, I, treatment for the type 3s? Uh, I prefer to start uh, as soon as possible, so three or four months, but it also depends on the craniofacial operations. Uh, so, um, and uh, most of the time I will be the last in line uh, with regard to the first couple of months because the craniofacial uh, problems are, are bigger. Uh, uh, actually, the ENT is, is uh, really on the end of the line, I guess. But, um, uh, so, but preferably I do the first operation, do both hands, do preferably <clears throat> as much as possible with regard to uh, osteotomies of the thumb and desynaxalizations. Um, uh, you need a lot of skin for the, the, the type 3 for the first and the second stage. Uh, so I want to finish both hands before the uh, age of uh, 12 months because after that I don't want to operate both hands anymore uh, on the same time because then it's it's really terrible for the children. Before that it's not a problem to miss both hands. They do anything with the, with the bandages as I showed. Okay. Our next question for Josh. Um, for ulnar lengthening, do they develop degenerative symptoms around the distal radial knot joint? What is your experience? Yeah, so it just depends on where their osteochondromas are. Uh, again, the most common location is the distal ulna, as I showed in several of those radiographs. So that the presence of the osteochondroma at the distal ulna will, by essence, destroy the DRUJ. And you never quite want to put the ulna back into the DRUJ where it would belong, as that will uh, ultimately cause them pain. 
The quest next question is related to that issue. So how much do you lengthen the ulna and do you observe any rotation decrease after the procedure? Yeah, so the goal is actually to improve range of motion in the forearm. Um, so hopefully you will improve it and not decrease it. Um, as far as the amount of lengthening, it certainly depends on the age of the child. So a younger child where we know that the distal ulna physis, which contributes, as we know, 80% of the length of the forearm um, is involved, we will over lengthen on purpose because we will know that we'll have to ultimately lengthen that child two or three times. Um, so really we'll max out each lengthening um, with the understanding that it'll become short again and we'll go back to do a lengthening. And a child that is approaching skeletal maturity, as I said, you wanna stop that lengthening just proximal to that DRUJ level um, to avoid any impingement of the DRUJ, which is malformed. I see. And for the single bone procedures, um, do you excise the dislocated radial head in every case or uh, only if it's painful? Just the latter. Only if it's painful or the bump really bothers them. Obviously, it's a separate incision to go get it and take it out with its own inherent risks. Uh, of nerve injury, et cetera, even in our, even though we're very cautious, but so I reserve it only if it's painful or cosmetically very bothersome to them. I see. I have a question for uh, Francisco. So in the cases we as, with CMC1 instability, uh, we've published a series uh, with APL uh, stabilization of the thumbs. And we have seen that many of these cases have a trapezium hypoplasia. So what is your experience with that? Have you seen that as well or any other one of the faculty, Francisco? Yes, yeah, that's, that's, a common, that's a common finding in the surgery. But you are able to stab, stabilize at least to, uh, to relieve the, the symptoms. Yes. So next question is uh, with regards to post-operative infections. So um, maybe, Christiane, what is your experience, especially if you leave the children for such a long period in the, in the bandage? I know this is a question maybe a lot of them have has asked you already, but uh, still, I mean, um, do you have seen any minor or major infections or what percentage? Well, it's a very good question. And indeed, it's a question everybody asks. Um, uh, we uh, uh, compared 200 uh, patients who had this type of bandage with uh, 200 patients who did uh, have a bandage uh, that was well uh, removed after a couple of weeks and then parents had to change it every day. And uh, then we saw less uh, infections um, and less problems uh, in the patient group that had a bandage on for four to six weeks. Uh, so, and if there are children who have uh, K-wires, I'll just leave them in for six weeks, no problem at all. Uh, and um, if they've got a fever, none of the patients, uh, it was a problem with the bandage or with uh, the operative field, it always was an ENT problem or something else. So, uh, I'm not afraid at all. Perfect. Even in the first which have more easily infections because of their different type of skin. Yeah. Thank you. Then we have one more question regarding bone wax, maybe to all of the faculty. Do you ever experience complications from bone wax whenever it's being used? No complications? Okay. Um, I have one more question for Josh. Uh, I mean, the major question is, and there's just one paper which came out from Mary Beth Isaki and their group. Uh, can or do you advocate for early distal ulna excision? For example, if you get referred a four or five year old child with uh, MHO, distal ulna osteochondroma, already some ulna shortening, not so severe, but uh, would you advise the parents to go for early ulna osteochondroma excision or just wait and see how it develops until they get some forearm rotation decrease or something? Yeah, so don't kill me, Sebastian. Um, I try and actually do a middle approach. So I don't do operate very early, but I do operate early on the minute I see or have some concern that it's growing. 
to affect the DRUJ region or the distal ulna physis. So unlike, let's say, Madelungs, where you may go release a Vickers ligament very early on, I don't prophylactically, quote unquote, take out the distal ulna osteochondroma in a four-year-old. Um, but the minute I have concern that it's heading in that bad direction, I am aggressive in getting rid of it, trying to, again, preserve the integrity of the forearm as much as possible. How about the other ones? Francisco, what is your experience or your recommendation for that issue? So my, my concern is the radiocapitular joint. So if there is a progressive loosening of forearm rotation, basically pronation, it means that uh, that uh, we need to do something. At that moment, I do the the Stockholm drama release and the lengthening of the ulna. But otherwise, I wouldn't do a resection I, unless there is. Sometimes there is a limitation of the rotation because there is an impeachment. We never talk about this impeachment between ulna and radius and, and then I, I would uh, excess, excise it. Okay, any other comments from the faculty <clears throat> with regard to this issue? No. Thomas or oh, Andre? Okay, you would go the same. Okay, so we are waiting yeah, I mean, for... The only comment, sorry, Sebastian, I would say to Francisco's point, I think I showed a couple of the impingement and it can happen both distally or proximally, causing that decrease in the forearm rotation. Mm -hmm. So we are waiting. We have uh, one or two more minutes to go, maybe from the audience. If somebody poses a question to this renowned faculty, please feel free now to ask me to do so. Um, one more question to Francisco. So uh, do you have experience in uh, mid couple instability to use cinematography to verify some of these issues you can see? Do you use it regularly? Yes. So when when you do <clears throat> normally when you do uh, ulnar deviation in the mid carpal, yes, ulnar deviation, you get dorsal uh, dislocation. That is what I see in the in the um, uh, fluoroscopy. And so, Sebastian, can I ask Francisco a question about the mid carpal, please? Yes. One more question, so, yeah. Francisco, any experience or comments? I have some I'm happy to share. Uh, regarding, as you mentioned, a lot of it is just for pain control. Um, and just doing a PIN norectomy with or without a thermocapsular shrinkage with a wrist arthroscopy. Any comments or experiences? So, um, what, yes, you, you can do uh, arthroscopically, uh, but if you have a very severe uh, instability uh, you, you should do open i think you cannot you cannot reduce the the length of the capsule enough if you do arthroscopically but you can do arthroscopically yes but i don't do arthroscopy when the, i have that case my my colleague does okay so any last question now from the faculty maybe if no ones are left from the audience Okay, so then we will formally close this session. Ralph? Yes, uh, I have to say I enjoyed this webinar very much. I would like to thank the speakers, of course, the organizers, Orthopediatrics for supporting this webinar, but most of all the interactive audience. Thank you very much for being interactive. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. And I wish everyone a good weekend. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye.